Coming to you right from Victory Church of Christ Ministries International here in Kampala, Uganda. I'm back with the Word of God in the midst of our global fight against the coronavirus. Our helper who can make us come to the solution to this pandemic is the Word of God. And that's why I'm glad that God has given us this opportunity to look at his word. Where the solution is. Eureka Kingdom time is a time for looking at the solution that God offers. To ask his people from his word. In the tackling of the kind of different kind of situations and circumstances that we face in life. And today I... I want us to look at a very important subject and, and that is the wrath of God. Some people argue that because Christ was sent by his father who has loved the world so much that he was ready to sacrifice his son and indeed he sacrificed him on the cross. Some people argue that because Christ came uh, the wrath of God is no longer uh, dispense against the earth, against the world by God. That's how some people argue it. But let's look at what the scripture says. We are going to look at examples from the Old Testament and also we shall look at examples uh, in the New Testament. But first of all, let's pray for God to enlighten us. Wonderful Father, the Father of lights, the creator of the universe, the king of kings, the lord of lords, our healer, our protector, our provider, the God who loved us so much and, and, and has always shown us his mercy again and again and he did it through his son. We ask you this morning, we ask you this new day that may you throw your light on your word enlighten us so that we may pick the solution that you have for us in your word. May your word deliver. May your word guide. May your word heal. May your word bless. We ask you all this in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And so uh, uh, what is the wrath of God? Let, let's begin from there. The wrath of God is, is anger uh, it is uh, his judgment. It is his indignation in response to man's wrong and injustice. When you, you look at the world, you begin from around your life and you see the kind of injustice that is going on around the world and the wrong things that men do. You realize that we have really a good and a merciful God. If God was like man, God would have judged the world again and again and in a very severe way. Maybe he would have even blotted away the world. But you see, because he cares for us and he has a great love, he has not done that. But from time to time, he reveals his wrath. That's what the scripture teaches us. 
you have also to understand that God's wrath or his anger is always holy and justified. There is always a good cause for God to be angry with men. God's wrath is displayed both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, it is important to understand that God has a plan for man. And when man rejects that plan, man begins to live in wickedness. And it is that wickedness that attracts the wrath of God. It is that evil, the evil kind of life that man lives minus God. You know, there's no way you can do what is right unless you walk with your maker. Unless man finds the one who created him unless we look at what he says and we are guided by what he says that is when we can begin to walk the right way let's learn something let's look at the history of israel in the old testament especially when they were going through the wilderness let's look at numbers chapter 14 verse 29 to 34. now in this passage God was taking his people. He had delivered them from the place of slavery, taking them to Egypt, to a place, I mean, taking them to Canaan, the place where God had promised that he would bless them there, would prosper them there, and it was actually a good land. So they were there on the way to their Canaan. Just like even today, God has blessed nations in many different ways, the Western world, Africa, the Far East, the entire world. There's a unique way in which God has blessed every group of people and every region. Uh, but just like the Israelites began to rebel on the way to their fulfillment, even today the nations have continued rebelling away from the good plan that God has for them. And he has revealed his plan for mankind through his scripture. Through the word. So in the wilderness, these fellows reached there and, and they rebelled. They rebelled against God's instruction to go and possess the land. They were given the grace. They were given the strength. Their army was blessed to go and fight and take the land. And why, why they were actually driving away the original occupants of those land was because of also wickedness. It was God judging those nations. It was in judgment because they were so wicked because they were doing so terrible things god told abraham promised that look your descendants will be in egypt in a far off country for 400 years and then when the sins of this land here which i've given you are full i'll bring them out with a mighty hand and with a great wealth because this land then would be ready to vomit away these people, the original occupants. That is how it is. When we turn away from God as nations, as people, as individuals, there's a way nature reacts to us, and especially against us. It becomes the, the, the effect of nature's reaction becomes contrary to the blessing that God would want us to have from those places where he has put us. So when they rebelled, look at what God told them. His wrath came upon them. Numbers 14, verse 29 to 34. This is what God said. In this desert, your bodies will, will fall. Every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me, not one of you will enter the land, I swear, with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jepune, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be, be taken as plunder, I'll bring them into, to, into to enjoy the land you have rejected. But you, your bodies will fall in this desert. Your children will be shepherded here for 40 years suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the desert for 40 years one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like 
to have me against you. Just look at this. That is how the, the wrath of God works. It's actually a response to rebellion. These people rebelled against his instruction. And uh, he, he said, but you should have known better. You saw how I helped you. You saw how I delivered you. You saw how I blessed you. You saw all those promises I made to your forefathers had, uh, concerning your deliverance. I've fulfilled them. And now I'm taking you to settle you and you are rebelling. And so these people suffered judgment from the 20 years old and above who had grumbled. They were all judged. They were to live there wandering in the days until the last of them dies there. And it took 40 years. And you can imagine it was all because they rejected. They rejected God's plan. When as nations and individuals and families, we reject God's plan for our lives, time comes when what remains for us is the wrath of God or the judgment of God, or the anger of God that manifests through serious suffering, terrible sufferings. I want us to look at another scripture again. Uh, it is very important for us to understand that the, the wrath of God comes when God's grace is ignored. Sometimes we talk about God's kindness, his mercy. That is a part of his grace. Grace has two faces. Just the face of mercy and kindness and forgiveness. Then it's like a coin with two faces. The other face is his power. His power. His mighty works. And even his judgment. And so wrath comes when God's grace is ignored. His kindness, his patience is ignored. And that's why the Apostle Paul told the Rom Romans that don't you realize that God's patience and his kindness towards you is meant to lead you to the place of repentance. But because you have decided to harden your heart, what remains for you is the wrath. That's what Apostle Paul said. You'll find that in Romans chapter 2. When you go through it, you'll find him warn the Romans. Now, in Isaiah 26, verse number 9 to 10, there's something which we can learn from here. Isaiah 26, verse 9 to 10. This, the background of this passage was, God was actually encouraging his people who were scattered among the nations, among the heathen nations. And God was telling them that, look, judgment is coming. I'm bringing judgment to the whole earth. But also, I have a way out for you. Just like it is now. This Plague Corona has attacked every continent. Every nation is under threat. People are dying so much. And that's why it is important for us to turn to God, to look at his word and, and find out what has gone wrong so that we can turn to the right path so that God can enable us to overcome, so that his grace can be availed. It is his hand that will deliver us from this plague. So Isaiah 26 verse 9 to 10, this is what the word says. My soul yearns for you in the night. In the morning, my spirit longs for you. When your judgment comes upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. You see, sometimes when God has shown his mercy to people, his kindness, and they don't respond. He follows it with judgment. He follows it with wrath. Verse number 10. Though grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and regard not the majesty of the Lord. Look. So sometimes, God responds with judgment, with the wrath. He sends in punishment when people ignore his grace, his kindness, his goodness, his open-handedness, 
his desire to embrace man. When we ignore it, judgment comes. So there are some people that the kindness of God can never help them. His grace towards them, his invitation to them won't help until judgment comes, until punishment comes. That's when they can turn to him. And that's when they can listen to him. Isaiah still, chapter 26, verse number 20 to 21. Go, my people, enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourself for a little while until his wrath has passed by. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the bloodshed upon her. She will conceal her slain no longer. Now, this is a word to God's people. Those who know God, those who have a covenant with God, this is the advice. Enter your rooms and shut doors behind you. This is a figurative language. Just like in the night where there's danger in the street, when you enter your house and you lock, you close the door, you are safe. You are safe. Now here God is telling those people that in the, in, the, in the midst of my judgment upon the world, the way you can come out of this wrath, the way you should respond, you go and hide in my presence. That is the presence of God. Remember Psalms 91, verse number 1. Those who keep themselves in the presence of God, who hide themselves under the shadows of their wings, they are safe. They are safe there. They are protected. So here we are told to enter into the presence of God, to go in by prayer, to go in by fasting. This is really what the figurative language used here. When the wrath of God is there, the, the best thing to do now that the wrath of God is revealed really, we have to pray for God to relent. We have to pray for God to have mercy upon the world. It is us who know the Lord, the people, the true people called by his name, who can go to him in the secret place of prayer and talk to him. And you see, we are told in verse 21 that see the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. So the wrath of God can come upon the entire earth. It is possible for him to deal with the nation like he dealt with Israel. It is also possible for him to judge wickedness in the entire earth. It is very much possible. And especially when there's a lot of terrible things done. Bloodshed. When there's a lot of bloodshed. Now I was looking at uh, some report some while ago that since abortion was legalized in the United States of America, over 60 million unborn children were murdered in cold blood. They were killed. You see, animals, the instinct animals have, their instinct is to protect the young ones. But you see, see how man has fallen the world over, the entire West. I'm talking only of USA. What about the entire Western world? Where abortion has become a right. Where politicians, in US, there's a certain group of politicians whose job, they talk about the right to life, but they're the very one who are at the forefront of advocating for the rights for women to kill their unborn babies. Imagine that. To kill them in a horrific way. And they have made merchandise out of it. And time comes when the earth will disclose the blood that has been poured. Time comes when the earth will disclose it. And I believe that that time is now. The entire Europe, the USA, and they're selling the same idea all over the world, even here in Africa, through Planned Parenthood, through marriage stops, and all those kind of so-called reproductive health NGOs. They're just here for their own agenda. Now, in the USA, 98%, in fact, about 80%, 80% of abortion clinics are in black communities. First of all, they're disadvantaged, they are not well educated, they are poor, 
And then their only hope is their children. Then you say, now we can help you kill away your children. So out of every five black pregnancies in USA, four is terminated. That is how wicked it is. So time comes when all that blood, the earth can no longer conceal it. Back here in Africa here, a lot of bloodbath, civil wars, many th wrong things that people are doing. People are being sold, children are being sold into slavery, modern slavery. Traffic through Middle East, taken to the East, taken to the West, is a terrible thing. Others are killed for their body organs and sold off. So God cannot just keep remaining quiet. He's so patient, that's why it takes long. And sometimes people <laughs> look at the quietness of God thinking that he, he, he doesn't care and he doesn't mind and they can continue in wickedness. No. The, the scripture is very clear about it. Very clear. The earth reaches a point when it can no longer conceal man's sin. It will be exposed and that's when judgment falls. Now let's look at the way out. Even in the Old Testament, God had worked a way out for us to come out of God's wrath. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 11 to 14. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord and the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and I've chosen this place for myself as a temple for us sacrifices when i shut up the heavens so that there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will i hear from heaven and i will forgive their sin and will heal their land just look at that so when the heavens are shut and there's drought that automatically has a, an economic implication. When, when there's drought, life becomes hard. People cannot grow their crops. Water will not be available. A, a lot of destruction comes. That is a step number one in God's judgment when he is he, manifesting his wrath upon a group of people, upon uh, a nation, upon the world that's that's what how he does it and then he says all oh, command locusts that's another stage locusts can come and eat away all the crop you become poor you begin to struggle you begin to lack of recent uh, of recent we have seen locusts come first of all recent years we saw a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, a, a lot of drought and then I'm a warm scam even in our country here and in most uh, a number of East African countries then it was followed by locust locust came right desert locust right from the deserts some of them the deserts of the Middle East they kept the cross into Africa eastern part of Africa here they kept devouring people's crop all those are signs of God's wrath is trying to catch our attention so that we can turn to him and cry out to him. And it, then is the third, look at the third point. Hmm? The third way he uses. Or when I send a plague, sickness. This one is now attack on the human body, human life, like the coronavirus now. It doesn't matter who may have begun it. There are so many theories behind it. But it remains the same, a plague. It's a plague. It's a plague. Man is no longer in control now as we speak. And that's why we need God. We are not in complete control. We are doing everything we can. It is helping little. We need God to stop it. It's like a fire that has gone wild. We need a firewall. And that's why we are turning to God so that a firewall can be put to stop this ravaging through the plague. He says when the plague comes like it has come now. This one is a pandemic now. He says when we humble ourselves, when we realize that we have walked away from him the honor of 
of, of, of our, our own owner, the one who has the plan, our own maker, when we have realized that we have lifted ourselves in pride and we have humbled ourselves, we have turned back to him and we pray to him and we seek him and we repent of our wicked ways. We turn away from our sins. He says he'll hear and heal and heal our land. And so, beloved, it is very important. You may be a believer, you may not be a believer, but let me tell you, God is real. In fact, even the people who say they don't believe God is there, they are not honest with themselves. Because if you are honest, when you look at creation alone, you say, no, there's a designer. I need to look for this person. When you look at just an organ in the body alone, when you look at a plant, at a flowering plant alone, the creation, Apostle Paul said they have no excuse because uh, uh, the invisible, invisible qualities of God can be known through the things he has created. And then you can start from there and look for him and find him. But it's not far. Apostle Paul, when he was talking to the people in Athens, he says he's not far from each one of us. He's near. But he also went ahead and said in the last days he has revealed himself to us through his son. That is Jesus Christ. And I want us to look, that was in the Old Testament. So the provision for mercy was there. The provision for grace was there. And it, is, it came through repentance. Now, even in the New Testament, some people argue that God no longer is no longer angry with people. No, that's a lie. That's not what the Bible says. They also teach that you can continue living the way you are as long as you have received Christ as Lord and Savior. You can continue living in sin. You can continue wallowing in immorality. You can continue in wickedness because what Christ has done is enough to clear everything for you. God is no longer angry with you because he offered Christ for you. That's a lie. Because a true believer, a true believer will obey Christ. So you cannot claim you belong to God and you disobey him and you live contrary. You cannot even say you have the grace of God when you continue living in sin. Because true grace will deliver you from the power of sin. That's what the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. Verse number 1. It is so clear. Now, in John chapter 3, verse 35 to 36, this is what the Bible says. Father loves his son. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life. Here we come but remains under God's angry judgment, remains under God's wrath. That is New Living Translation. NIV Translation says this, the father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects, here we come again, the son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. Just look at that. If you don't obey Jesus, you cannot experience eternal life. You can't. You can't. You cannot experience eternal life. You remain under God's wrath. So God's wrath is real. It's real in this life. It's real in the life to come. Whoever rejects the son will not see life. For the wrath remains on him. It's just a matter of time. They will begin to manifest. That is it. So both the Old Testament and the New Testament teaches about the wrath of God. Now Jesus gave a very interesting parable. You find it in Luke chapter number 16, verse 19 to 31. About the story of Lazarus, the beggar, and the rich man. Both of them died and they went to heaven. And the rich man, because he, he was not uh, reconciled with God, he went to hell. 
but Lazarus was in heaven. And when this man experienced a lot of torment in hell, through hell fire, he was able to see across the divide, Father Abraham and Lazarus. They were in paradise. He called and said, Father Abraham, help me. Send Lazarus back on earth. Let him go and warn. I have five brothers I've left behind there. Let him go and warn them that they should be careful with their lives so that they don't come here. After the life on earth, after that life on earth, they should not come in this wrong place, in hell. And, and Father Abraham told him, he said, no, they have the prophets to warn them. They have the word of God there with them. They have it. They have Moses, the teaching of Moses to warn them. They have the teaching of the prophets to warn them. To warn them. They have the scriptures to warn them. And so, it was a sad thing for that man. Eventually, he ended up under judgment in a place where you cannot come out for eternity. For eternity. And now, I want us to look at the warning against false teachers because even for people who believe who say that they are believers and they teach others otherwise contrary to what the word of God says the Bible also warns that judgment will come upon them not only will the world be judged the people they have deceived be judged and they will suffer God's wrath but even they themselves they are doomed that's what the scripture says especially the hyper grace teachers who says that the grace of God is sufficient? You can live the way you want. They keep people, they return people who are trying to escape from life of wickedness and slavery back to the same place. Now, Second Peter chapter 2. Now, let's first look at Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 to 7. Let's look at the example of how the ancient world suffered. And then we shall look at the judgment that will come upon the false teachers. Let's look at the, how God judged the ancient world. And how God is warning us that unless we heed his word and his warning, we will also suffer the same. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 5 to 7. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. So in Noah's time, God used the flood. Even up to today, floods come and sweep away cities, parts of cities, coastal lines, settlements that swept out. We have seen flood again and again in recent years, in the recent decades. Verse number six. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen to the ungodly people. You just look at that. Recently, I was seeing a, a clip going around, clips going around the social medias. And it was... Uh, very mega celebration by homosexuals in Italy just before the corona struck. Mega, mega celebration by the lesbians and the, the gays and the lesbians. All kind of sexual perverts. They had a huge party across Italy. I've been seeing that clip and other places. They were in their oogies Wild life, it is unspeakable when you see that clip. You see what men can do. The filth involved. The degradation of human life. The degradation of, 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 of values. Where human lives are degraded, completely degraded. Every value, whatever is of value is thrown away. And these are the same people who don't even spare. They don't spare children. 
They messed them up. But shortly after that, judgment struck. And those very areas where there's a lot of reports of rebellion against God's word, they are now facing a lot, a lot of trouble, a lot of suffering. Because you can't break the word of God. You can't scoff at him and you go scot-free. No. Time comes when your sin will catch up with you. Time comes when judgment truly will come. That is what has been going on. Abortion. Murder. Crime on the streets. Drugs. All kind of violence. They are everywhere all over the world. Families. There are people who are systematically working out programs of destroying families in the Western world. They have even come to the developing nations with their agenda. Devaluing marriage. Promoting perversion. Sex with animals. Incest. As something good. But when you look at it all, it is something that destroys. It is something that degrades. It is something that promotes ill health. It is something that brings sickness. And it is something that attracts judgment from God. The wrath of God. That's why it is very, very important for us not to ignore the warning that is there in the scripture. Verse number 7. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Even now, God can rescue us when we repent. Even the, 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 the godly, the people who are godly, who are living in the world today, stand in the gap for the rest of the world. Cry to God to relent. Cry to God to step in to deliver the world. Cry for him to save you from the judgment so that you don't suffer it together with the rest. But stand also in the gap so that God can relent. Pray for the people whose heart has been hardened against God so that they can turn to him and so that this calamity can can seize. Let's look at one of the last scriptures I want us to look at. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 17, and then we shall look at verse 19 to 21. This is warning against false teachers. And, and that describes us, these are wells without water. False teachers will not bring out something good. Clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They are reserved for darkness. They are, they are reserved for judgment. You have to think twice. If you are a hyper, hyper grace teacher that tells people that it is okay to continue living the way you have been living because the grace of God is sufficient. No, that is not the grace. That's fake grace. The grace of God gives you the power to break loose from sin. And that's why Apostle Paul warned Timothy. He told Timothy that in the last days, you will have people who will have a form of godliness, but devoid of power, have nothing to do with them. If you claim to know God, you claim to belong to Christ, and you don't have the power to walk away from sin, repent and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior and receive the true grace. That will give you the power to say no to ungodliness. Because the Bible makes it clear that there is no seeing God without holiness. Now, verse number 19 of this second Peter chapter 2. It says, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. Verse number 20. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
They are again entangled therein and overcome. The later end is worse with them than the beginning. For it has been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. Yeah, we are commanded to live a holy life. That is what we are commanded. So, false teachers, people who are teaching the wrong doctrine, that keeps people in sin. They console people that know the wrath of God is not there. God loves you. God is ever loving. He's ever loving. He doesn't judge. No, judgment and wrath is a part of his nature. That's why Christ died on the cross. He poured his wrath on Christ so that through Christ you can have the power to live a new life. That is what eternal life is about. It's God's own life given to us through our faith in Christ. What is the way out? Let's look at Romans 5, uh, verse number 6 to 10. You see, at just the right time, when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God, on his own initiative, worked out a way to bring man out of slavery to sin, out of condemnation, out of separation completely from him. He worked out a way by through the death of Christ. Verse number seven. Very rarely will, he, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid a price. When we accept him and we accept what he did for us, we are given the power to receive the eternal life. To become sons and daughters of God. We are reconciled to him. And this was an act of God's love. So we are justified. Verse number 9 says, Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from the wrath through him? We are justified. We are cleansed. We are washed. We walk with him now. That's the way out. The way out for everybody is to turn to God and receive Christ as Lord and Savior and receive the eternal life, God's own life that gives you the power to live a new life. Eternal life is God's own life through the presence of the Holy Spirit in you as a believer. That's where the power comes from. Verse number 10, for if when we are God's enemies, we are reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? The moment we turn to God and receive Christ as Lord and Savior, we have his own life inside us. And the life we begin to live now is that very life, the life of Christ in us. That's how change comes. Of course, it's a result of repentance, turning away from your own sins. Changing your mind about the way you were living. Accepting to obey what God says. That's the way out. That is the way out for everybody. The, that is the bottom line. There's no other way out. Religion won't save you. Your effort won't save you. But receiving Christ as Lord and Savior. Repenting of your sins. Receiving him as your Lord and Savior. Is what will save you. Because he paid for your sins. Christ paid for your sins. And so when you accept that payment. You will be given that righteousness. And you will be forgiven. Washed, cleansed by his blood. Perhaps you are there and you have not heard Christ 
you have never received him as your Lord and Savior in your heart, I want to give you this opportunity to invite Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. Because it takes his power for you to become a child of God. When you receive him as your Lord and Savior, God's wrath is removed from over your life. And you experience instead his joy, his peace. And you can begin to fellowship with him. You talk to him in prayer. It begins to talk back to him. It begins to talk back to you. You can train yourself to listen to the voice of God. You begin to read his word from the gospel. You start with the gospel. Then you read the entire Bible. And in that way, your life won't remain the same. And if you're there, maybe you have backslidden, you can still rededicate your life to God by receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, by accepting him to be the Lord of your life. Many people, they want God, but they don't want God to be the Lord of their life. Salvation is, is about totally submitting to the Lordship of Christ in every area of your life. You surrender every area of your life to him. When you do that, that's when you will see the change and experience the difference. If you're there and you're ready to give your life to Christ as your Lord and Savior, follow this simple prayer of commitment after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I come to you as a sinner. Forgive me. I repent of all my sins. Right now, I invite you, come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. Amen. If you say that prayer from your heart, you are saved by grace through faith in Christ. Jesus, after all this uh, season of social distancing is over and the church begins to commune again, find a church near you where you can go and fellowship in order to grow spiritually. In order to grow spiritually. Do that and your life won't remain the same. If you are near us, if you are near us, you, can, you are most welcome to Victory Church of Christ Ministries International here in Kampala in a place called Luzira and we shall welcome you and help you to start your new walk in Christ and uh, before I end this message I want us to pray for those who are sick we are going to pray for those ones who are sick so that the grace of God can visit them. We shall also repent for our own nation and for the nations of the world for God to visit them with mercy and healing. I want to pray if you are sick, maybe you, have, you are under corona attack or perhaps any other ailment, still it is the same God who will heal you. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I commit every person who is sick into your hands. May your mighty hand rest upon them. I rebuke that sickness to go. I rebuke the virus to die from their bodies. I speak life. I speak healing. I pray for people who are suffering from other ailments, from cancer, from all kinds of conditions in the nervous systems, in the bones, in the muscles, in the abdomen, in every organ of the body, the different organs of the body that are diseased. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak life unto them and I rebuke infirmity and sickness to go. I declare in the name of Jesus, receive your healing, receive your deliverance. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And Father, have mercy upon the nations of the world and deliver the world from the corona pandemic. Deliver the entire world. 
deliver East Africa, deliver our nation. Father, let the blood of Jesus preserve the people of Uganda. Forgive our nation. Forgive our people where we have gone wrong. And we have gone wrong in many ways. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive East Africa. Forgive the people of this continent. Forgive Europe. Forgive America. Forgive South America. Forgive the Asian nation. Forgive the Arab nations, Lord. Forgive, Lord, Father, the Far East. Remember China, Lord. Remember Australia. Remember the nations in the islands of the world. Father, let your forgiveness come and let your healing come. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And also, I want to take this opportunity to speak to our friends and partners. I'm keeping you people in prayer. And our members of Victory Church of Christ Ministries International, I'm praying for you. May the grace of God rest upon your lives. May God preserve you. May God bless you. May God make a way for you where there seems to be no way. And uh, keep in touch with us through the, 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 the lines that are there and, and through the, my Facebook, through the, the, the WhatsApp and, and other medias that uh, are already indicated in our streaming and even in our television program and uh, continue sending in your support for the work of God. Send your tithe through the telephone uh, numbers that are indicated there and even the, the bank accounts that are there that are clear, uh, clearly indicated on the screen. You can send your uh, money straight there. Those who are able to who are living within the reach of the church, you can always drop your, 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 your offerings and your support in the boxes that are there. You can always place it there. There are always people that are taking care of the sanctuary there. And uh, I want you to advise you also that follow all the guidelines that the Ministry of Health has, has given us. Make sure that you keep your hands clean. Don't touch your eyes. Don't touch your nose. Don't touch your mouth. Keep away from crowded places. Constantly wash your hands. It's one of the biggest protection against the coronavirus. And until next time, with Eureka Kingdom time, may God abundantly bless you. Amen. Majesty Majesty
Majesty, 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 forever, forever I am changed by your love in the presence, in the presence of your majesty forever Lord forever I am changed by your love in the presence in the presence of your majesty Say, I need you more. 